It's blinding. You're right, it can't see anyone. Okay, take a deep breath. Hello, everyone. Okay. You can't beat a woman. Some of the lessons I've learned working with women, for women, for over 30 years. It was in 1982, I had just graduated, I was raring to go, I was earning some money, my own money, and I was gonna change the world. When a good friend of mine said, hey Ivy, they've opened a women's aid organization, they've opened a shelter specifically for women who need protection because they were being beaten up by their husbands. See, we both were convent girls, my school friend and I, and we were schooled by the nuns to say we must give back to the community. We must give back and do some service. We must do charity work. So there we were at our first Women's Aid Organization volunteer meeting. I remember it being a very hot night and it was made hotter because it was a tiny living room in the shelter. There were about 15 to 20 women all huddled, everyone talking at the same time. And there was one central question we were trying to answer. Why is it that husbands beat their wives? Some said, it must be the alcohol, right? Others said, oh, he must be very, very stressed out. Or maybe as a mistress. Some even said, hey, it must be Indians, right? Some said, no, 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 I know Chinese also beat up their wives. There are also Malays who beat up their wives. She just men just beat their wives. And others also said, it must be because they are confused, that they had troubled childhoods. Well, whatever it was, we all agreed that no one deserved to be battered. But while we were trying to figure out why men beat their wives, there was one woman sitting in the far corner and shaking her head and saying, listen, women, men beat up their wives because we allow them to do it, because we give them permission to do it. We live in a society where men and women are unequal, whether it's in the home, whether it's in the school place, whether it's in the workplace, we are unequal. And so men had all this power over us and women were excluded from that power. She said we live in a society that is patriarchal, where men held all the power, all the power. She then said to us, think to yourselves, think to yourselves, how is your, are your own lives affected? Have you as a girl or a woman been discriminated? Well, I started looking at my own life. Were, was I being treated differently because I was a girl? Were any of you girls around here in, in this room, were you treated differently because you were a girl? And then it started occurring to me that, why did that man touch me in the bus? Why is it that at home I was doing most of the housework? Why is it my parents were telling me, Ivy, you better not go out in the sun. You're going to get dark. You'll never get a husband. We're going to save money to get a dowry for you. We're going to choose a husband for you. Don't go out late at night. It's very dangerous. But my brother could go out late. The men could go out late, but not you as a girl. And I suddenly realized that we had all these rules and expectations. Don't be fat. Don't be dark. You know, be good. Be a good girl. Don't wear mini skirts. Just be a good girl because you're Going to, we are going to get you ready to become a wife. So when it came to domestic violence, she just asked us a very important question, and that was a very sharp question. If you were to see your neighbor's house, walk, looking at the neighbor's house, and you see a burglar get into the house, you will not hesitate to call the police. However, if you hear the cries of a woman, the wife, or it could even be the daughter, saying, don't beat me, don't beat me, please stop beating me. What do we do? Will we call the police or will we hesitate? You see, in a society where men had the power, a lot of us feel, society and the community feels, that what happens in a private home where the husband is the king, that he's the king of the castle, he's allowed to do whatever he wants. And that's when it occurred to me that night, I learned a lot of lessons, but the personal is the political that patriarchy affects all of us, it affects all, my, all our lives, that we too are discriminated, 
that I wasn't going to join women's aid organization as a volunteer to do charity work. It was a cause. It was going to be a passion. We were going to fight a cause to make sure that women are equal, that all political structures, social structures, economic structures, whatever law and policy that discriminates against women, that reinforces the notion that somehow we are not equal to men and therefore we could be treated differently in a negative way, we're going to challenge that. Now, in order to do our work, the other lesson I learned was we needed to adopt a feminist ideology. It's there, I've said it, the word feminist. It's an F word, I know. But basically, what does the F word mean? Feminism is about recognizing that men and women are equal. And I'm sure everybody in this room here will definitely, definitely agree to that. But there's an added criteria to this. The added criteria is that we must take action. We have to take action in order to do that. And with feminism came along something amazing. It came along with sisterhood. Wherever I traveled, and I've been to over, you know, almost 30 countries and worked with lots of women's groups, you know, especially around the issue of domestic violence, wherever I went, there was a shared common experience. As a woman from Afghanistan, as a woman from Nepal, as a woman from Malaysia, we had a shared common experience. And that common experience was that we have all faced discrimination. We've all been treated differently because we are women. Let me share a story with you. At the shelter, this sisterhood was very strong. There were women who sought shelter because they needed protection, because they could not handle any more the abuse. One hot afternoon, we heard rattling at the gates. And we were very high gates. We make sure the gates are very high, because sometimes the husbands try to climb over the gates. But this time, there were uniformed officers, immigration officials, who were saying, open the gates now, because you have undocumented, of course they didn't use the word undocumented, they say you've got illegal domestic workers here, open it up, we got a complaint, we have a letter, a complaint, public have complained, you've got illegal workers here. We try to explain to them, yes, they are illegal, they've become undocumented because they had to run away from the abusers, and of course they're not going to go and get their passport, right? The passports are held by the employers. They came into the shelter, they took away four Indonesian domestic workers, put them in a van, and drove off. We were undeterred. We got into our cars, we followed the van to the headquarters of immigration in Kuala Lumpur. We marched into the office and we said, release these women. Here are the police reports. They are genuine abuse cases. Release them. I called the press. I called the lawyers. I managed to go and talk to the women who were in a little cell within the office. And I said to them, don't you worry. We are going to remain here and we will sleep in the corridors until and when you'll be released, because we didn't want them in the middle of the night for them to take away and be deported to, back to Indonesia. Finally, at 2 a.m., with all that pressure and us already making, making ourselves comfortable in the corridors, <laughs> they released them at 2 o'clock in the morning. The very next week, the following week, rather, there was a lot of news about the raid against women's aid organization. And there was a lot of people who supported us. But some people were very critical about us. They said, why did you alert the press? Why did you make it public? You were embarrassing the immigration officers. You know, maybe you should have been a bit more careful. You could have talked it out. But public scrutiny was important. Because when you do everything behind closed doors, people need to do the public needs to know that there was something going wrong here. See, we learned a very long time ago in women's aid organization and the women's movement, we cannot be afraid of authority. We cannot sit saying, Oh, we better be careful. Don't question the police. Uh, don't don't uh, make any complaints about how they've not been very professional. Let's not talk about immigration or social workers. The authorities will keep quiet because our shelter will be shut down. If we start doing that, that's as good as saying that we, they become our batterers, that basically they are making us live in fear, and we don't want to live in fear. Another example of sisterhood was when we were lobbying for the Domestic Violence Act. We found out very quickly that there was no law to protect women. So in 1985, we came together, we formed a coalition called the Joint Action Group Against Violence Against Women. I know it's a bit of a mouthful. And we started lobbying for the Domestic Violence Act. And we were told for nine years 
that we cannot have this law because we cannot include Muslim women in this law. They said, just have it only for non-Muslim women. That will not do. He said, we can only have a law that includes every woman. We are not going to leave our sisters behind and only benefit a small community of women. The law was passed in 1994, but guess what happened? Two years later, the law was not a reality. They did not gazette the law, so we couldn't actually use the law. Again, the same arguments. Mm, we're not so sure. Maybe we shouldn't use this for the Muslim women. Again, we said, we are not going to leave our sisters behind. We move this and we move it together. We move together. So what is a girl to do? Arguments, logic did not prevail. So we decided to do a protest. Now, this is 1996. This is way before you know, public assembly was made legal in this country. So in 1996, a motley group of 30 women, we went to a hotel and we protested. We had a banner and we said, implement the Domestic Violence Act now. Why the hotel? Because we knew the minister who was in the hotel was going to come out any moment and we basically ambushed her and gave her the memorandum. We were scared because you have to remember this is 1996 where if you were to protest, if you were to go on a rally, you'll be detained, you'll be arrested. But we stood firm because we didn't want to let our sisters down. And today we can say, because of the courage of those women who stood up against the authorities, we now have a Domestic Violence Act, possibly the first, in fact, the first Muslim nation in the region, if not the world, that protects women on domestic violence. So, what is there to do? Thank you. And finally, I want to now share a really good idea, an idea worth sharing. When I look back at the work that we have done for 30 years, we can be very proud, we're extremely proud. We can see we have made a lot of gains. We've got treaties, we've got laws and policies and programs to promote women's human rights. In fact, in a country like Malaysia, the highest law in the land, the federal constitution, recognizes the fact that women are equal to men. But something is not right, people. Something is not right. The Me Too movement was a wake-up call for us all over the world. Women in India, in Afghanistan, in Australia, in Kyrgyzstan, to Pakistan, to Vietnam, to Philippines, to Singapore. Every, well, all these women in all these countries were sharing stories about sexual harassment, sexual assault, and rape. Every day, someone was breaking the silence and saying, it is real. We are facing these violations. We've experienced these violations. And what was worse was that the structures, the people who were supposed to be making sure this doesn't happen, in fact, the political structures, the corporate structures, were enabling these men and protecting these men and hiding the fact that these men were committing crimes against women. We've become a statistic. We reel off statistics as if it's biasa, as if it's norm, as the status quo. One out of three women in their lifetime have been sexually or physically abused. In some countries, 70% of the women have been abused. We earn 23% less than men. In Asia, 40% less than men. A Bangladeshi worker earns what? The worker earns, a female worker earns in one year is less than what the owner of Walmart earns in one second. We spend more hours, three to ten hours more in housework, in care work. And finally, a statistic that is not to be accepted. This statistic makes me angry, it makes me sad, but most of all, it makes, motivates me to do something. Globally, 38% of women, 38% of women are murdered by their intimate partners, either a boyfriend or a husband. I refuse to be a statistic. 
we refuse to be another statistic. So what are we to do? We need to do something to shake this all up. We need to do something drastic. So I want to share an idea that some of us in the Global South, activists from the Global South have been thinking about. We need to mount a day without women. It's not a new without women. A day without women basically means a strike, but it's going to be a global strike. Every corner of the world, women are going to come out of their villages, their towns and cities, wherever they are, from the bedroom to the boardroom, whether you're working in an office, whether you're working in a factory, whether you're working in, on the streets, we're going to withdraw from work. We're going to withdraw from household care. Sorry, household work. We're going to withdraw from care work. Why? We may even withdraw from sex. We can have a sex strike. Now, you may think, sex strike? Well, that's what women in Liberia did. They withdrew from sex in 2003, and they managed to end a civil war that, was, that went on for 14 years. When women go on we know that we are going to hold men, not only men, but the community accountable. When we go on strike, what we're saying is that we have the power to shut it all down because we know we are sustaining communities, we're sustaining nations, we're sustaining families. So what we need to do is to have a collective action to come together on 8th of March, because it's International Women's Day, every year, 8th of March, we're celebrating you know, the, 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 the gains of the women's movement. But at the same time, on the 8th of March, from now onwards, we should have a huge strike, a global strike, a global sisterhood of sisterhood, where we come together to express our collective anger, our collective demands, our dreams and hopes and aspirations our demands to say that we need to stop this exploitation. We need to stop violence against women. We simply have to stop the misogyny. I've always been inspired by the words of Leela Watson, an Australian indigenous woman who said, if you've come to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you've come because your liberation is bound up with mine, work together. My friends, there's nothing more joyous, more awesome, more fabulous than when women come together to make, become an indomitable force, when we come together to work because we are most inspiring and we are most promising when we do that. We become an indomitable force. In fact, we then become unbeatable. Thank you. Thank you.